So um, as an introduction, I'm in central time zone. I am in uh, Fort Worth area in Texas. And we've got two West Coasters here with us as well. Yeah. LA and a little OC. south of LA. <laughs> yeah. Should we do uh should we do some actual intros? Sure. All right, I'll start. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining us today uh, for this webinar. Uh, my name is Austin. Uh, I'm a senior content developer. Uh, I've been with Sketchy for about two and a half years now uh, in terms of background. So uh, trained as a surgeon, uh, but now I'm working in uh, specifically medical education. Uh, and since we're gonna be talking about chest X-ray interpretation today, uh, just a quick, uh, fun fact story time. Uh, so I'll tell you guys a little bit about the first time I was pimped by an attending. And so this was a uh, first year of med school, of course. Uh, we were taking anatomy and I remember uh, we had a uh, retired cardiothoracic surgeon come in and uh, he brought in a lot of films and we had a lot of people with us at the time. And so he uh, went over all these x-rays and ask all these questions. And I remember at the time, I didn't know any of the answers and it was very overwhelming. I was anxious. So the reason why I'm sharing this story with you guys is that, uh, you know, it's normal to feel that way. Um, I'm sure some of you have uh, been in those situations or if you have not already, you will be uh, going into third and fourth year. And so, um, here at Sketchy, you know, we hope to provide you with the tools that you need to really not just do well on your exams, but remember the information when it comes to uh, the important time, uh, like stressful situations and whatnot. So, but yeah. Um, I'm Ben. I'm the creative director here at Sketchy. Uh, I kind of have a similar path to Austin. Actually, I used to be a urologist, and then I realized that my uh, my true calling was making cartoons for you all. Um, so I have kind of the, the bookend to that, to Austin's story. Uh, when I was a, an intern, uh, first year of residency, um, we got consulted by medicine for a patient who had sudden onset abdominal pain. I went and saw him and he seemed all right, but definitely had some pain. You know, I was sort of waffling about what to do and talked to my senior who said, yeah, let's get a chest x-ray and just check things out. So I ordered that and then late that night um, got paged again by medicine and uh, the senior, the medicine senior talking to me, the surgery intern said, hey, just got this chest x-ray back. Uh, it looks okay to me, but just wanted you guys to have a look too uh, and, and sent it over and I took a look at it. And okay, so I did all, I did all the stuff that we're going to tell you. I definitely went through like all the a, B, C, D, E, and looked at all the zones and everything, but I immediately was like, oh my God, there's air under the diaphragm, uh, and caught that, that a, a senior medicine resident had, and so was, that was like my proudest moment of all of residency. Um, so it's definitely a learning process, like Awesome said, but you, you can definitely get there. Absolutely. And my name is Lauren. I am the director of medical curriculum here at Sketchy, and I'm an anesthesiologist by trade. I've worked in both uh, private practice as well as academic roles and currently working here at Sketchy. And my x-ray story um, is going back to med school and internship years. Um, I started med school a long time ago, and uh, this is before we had the PAC system. And, you know, like, on scrubs when they put the film up on the x-ray box. So that was my job was to go down to radiology in the morning and get the films. Uh, so that way we could pop them up on the x-ray box for rounds. And I always volunteered for that job because with the old films, if you tilted it, you could see where the radiologist touched it. So it was sort of the touch sign. And that was kind of like a secret to figuring out where the pathology really lied. Uh, Cause that was always where you know, there was something off on the, the chest film. So that was always a good job to be able to go down to the basement and get the films. So that is my old school x-ray film tip. Classic gunner move, classic gunner. Yeah. <laughs> so we're gonna do just a really brief intro and take you all through a sketchy clinical lesson. And 
when you're on our sketchy site, we have sort of these video lessons. And instead of playing a video for you, since you have three um, experts here in medical education, we wanted to actually walk you through a lesson ourselves. We're gonna leave plenty of time for Q&A and some final thoughts. And um, we're also going to be distributing a discount code at the end. So please stick around to the end and it'll be worth your while. Uh, so I'm going to give a super quick uh, overview on what Sketchy actually is, but just out of curiosity, if you've used Sketchy before, uh, put a six in the chat. Oh, it's like a thumbs up. And if you haven't used Sketchy before, put a nine in the chat. Looks like a thumbs down. Um, so hopefully, as if you know already or if you've seen from all these pictures, Sketchy is a visual learning platform. Uh, it's been used at this point by more than 400,000 students, which is pretty crazy. Uh, and it's kind of a key resource in med school um, because it's fun, because it makes studying easier, easier, and most importantly, because it improves scores. I am obviously very biased, but I did use Sketchy as a med student as well, um, so I can attest to that. Um, so if you haven't used Sketchy before and you're wondering if it would work for you, uh, if you feel on your wrist here and you have a radial pulse, then Sketchy will work for you. Uh, but if you want to remember stuff quickly, if you want to remember it forever, um, and if you genuinely want to have fun while you're studying, then Sketchy is for you. Yeah, and I just saw a shout out in the chat for our farm and micro content, and that's definitely what we, that was, that was our original content, and that's what we're definitely known for. And we wanted to take this opportunity to introduce some of our clinical content that we've made specifically for you all. Um, we've heard that you want short lessons that are easy to fit into your day and we have created them. So the lesson we're going over tonight comes from our clinical essentials collection. And um, it's sort of like a best of compilation. We have four courses right now in our clinical content, IM surgery, uh, PEDS and OBGYN and neurology is going to be coming out this summer and that was student requested. So we hear your requests and we're making it happen. Um, so our lesson lives in clinical essentials and it's also originally from our IM content. And we created a new unit in our IM content um, last month and it's called Sketchy Pearls. And what we did here is we put content in that maybe you're not going to learn in school or you're not going to read in a book. And we specifically created this unit for our students because we wanted to give you these tips and tricks to help you shine on rotation. And our clinical essentials and a lot of our content here is geared to take you from the board studying, you know, that hardcore step one studying and take you out into the clinical rotations and give you the confidence that you need to really succeed and thrive and step into your rotations with confidence the first day. So we're hoping to deliver on that. Yeah, and I particularly saw that a lot of you said your uh, MS2s in the chat earlier. So this clinical essentials collection is made just for you as you transition into third year and start to you know, spend more time doing clinical work on the wards. Um, this content is made to help you with that transition, so. Enough, enough chatter. Everyone put a six in the chat anyway. You all know what sketchy is. You don't need us to tell you. So let's uh, talk about chest x-ray interpretation uh, with, <laughs> with our friend Gino here. Um, so just a quick note about uh, sort of how we make these lessons. Um, so for this one, we, you know, we knew we were talking about chest x-rays. Lungs are obviously a pretty important part of that. And the way we typically symbolize lungs at Sketchy is with the sails of a sailboat. So we knew we wanted to do uh, sort of an ocean scene or something with a sailboat in it. Uh, we thought that this kind of like dark image really brings you into the, the reading room where awesome is kind of makes you feel that chest x-ray dark vibe. Uh, and we thought lightning looked cool, you know, and then especially once you make a lightning rib cage, it just looks super cool. Uh, you can kind of see the, the shadow of the chest x-ray there behind the lightning. Um, so we thought this was a nice way to kind of bring you into the world, uh, serve as that hook so that when you're thinking about chest x-rays, you immediately remember this image, uh, and then we'll bring in our lung ship a little later. Yeah, so here we have our first symbol. Um, so basically, this, this goes perfect with our, our theme. Uh, we have a peer here. And what does peer represent? Um, anybody, if you want to post in the chat. 
Um, I'll give you guys a few seconds. Uh, but peer is basically, uh, it's, it's going to be position, inspiratory effort, exposure, and rotation. It's the mnemonic that's used to determine how uh, image quality uh, in a chest x-ray. So we want to make sure the image is a high quality image. And so we want to know how is the x-ray taken? Position, um, is it an AP supine, a PA, upright? Uh, lateral, inspiratory effort. Uh, we'll, patient has to take in a deep breath in uh, so we can see the lungs. Uh, we should be able to see the posterior ribs, eight, number eight through 10. And then exposure um, is basically, helps us delineate between uh, gas, liquid, and uh, bone. So for a well-penetrated x-ray, you should be able to see the vertebral bodies. Rotation is gonna be important because if the chest x-ray is abnormally rotated, things are gonna look differently. And uh, to check for rotation, uh, we have the spinous processes in the center and we have the medial borders of the clavicle and the distance between the medial borders of the clavicle and the spinous process should be on the same for both sides. Yeah, and we'll show you a film in just a minute to demonstrate some of those uh, characteristics that Allison's chatting about. Yep. Got a mnemonic inside our visual mnemonic. It's like mnemonic section. It's amazing. So this, exactly. this is revolutionary in content. So you can see on our pier, the first boat that shows up is the A boat. And that is to remind us to look at the airways. And that's sort of the first thing that we're gonna assess um, after we've established that it's a high quality film using our peer criteria. And looking at the, the X-ray, we're going to look for the airway structures starting with the trachea, which should be midline and also patent. Um, and then you'll see the trachea branch at the crina into the right and the left main stem bronchi. Um, and you can see on our sketch that the right main stem bronchi um, has more, sort of a more acute angle, whereas the left one's a little bit more flat and that is reflective of you know, airway anatomy. And that's why when we aspirate stuff, it tends to go down the right side. And as an anesthesiologist, I've definitely been a part of some fishing expeditions to go and retract the firm body that fell down the right main stem bronchi bronchus. So we have an overlay up next. So within our sketches, we like to use, um, we call them pips or picture in picture. And this allows us to integrate um, things like x-ray films, um, you know, different micro slides, uh, different pictures within our sketches uh, to really drive home those visuals. So in our chest x-ray sketch, we have a chest x-ray embedded within the sketch. So that way, when we're talking about the mnemonics, you can also genuinely see the chest x-ray. And looking at this chest x-ray, you know, first we did the peer criteria that Asim was telling us about, and we're looking um, at the exposure and we're counting the ribs. And then I'm gonna go straight down the center where Ben just drew those red lines. And I'm gonna look at my airway structures. And you can see that the trachea is indeed midline. It's not shifted either side, it's patent. Um, I can see the right main stem, left main stem, and I can also see the bronchus. Oh, I'm sorry, the, the carina right there in the middle. Yeah, this is a fun way, I think, just to reemphasize how the, the art and the actual anatomy sort of help reinforce each other. So yeah, and then um, when we're viewing our sketches, we'll have that picture in picture pop up with the chest x-ray, then we'll go back to our original x-ray and you can see that we have our sails that represent the lungs. And um, that's kind of one of our recurring symbols within Sketchy. And those of you that are familiar with our content know that we like to use those recurring symbols and that's what helps create those memory jogs and those you know really memorable characters that you remember when you're studying. So that way, when you're in a high stress situation, you know, either on an exam or you're being pimped or you're in a like kind of a high stress clinical situation, these memory jogs keep coming up and um, they're so repetitive that they really ingrain themselves into your brain and they make it really easy to recall. 
Uh, cool. So uh, B is for breathing uh, and Ben for that matter. Uh, so uh, in an x-ray, when we're talking about breathing, we're thinking about the lungs, uh, which, you know, hopefully are, are pretty um, obvious there. And then uh, the pleura, which usually you actually won't see unless there's some pleural thickening. So we threw this kind of thick sail cover up there to represent that idea of pleural thickening. Uh, it's only visible on x-ray if there is that thickening. Uh, and then for radiographic purposes, each lung is divided into three zones that are about a third each of the lung's height. Um, so these are different than the lobes of the lung. That's important. Um, it's just a, it's a purely radiographic distinction, um, but it's a way for you, uh, one, to make sure that you're being very systematic as you look at the lungs, that you're looking at each zone, uh, zone by zone, rather than just trying to like look around the whole lung and see if you can identify any pathology. Uh, and two, so that when you're talking about where you've seen something, you can give um, another person sort of a general idea of where to look by referencing uh, which zone they should be looking in. These aren't super well defined anatomically, so it's it's like a, a rough um, estimate, more so than a, a specific, but it's a nice way of organizing your thoughts. Um, one, other, one other point, sorry, Austin, uh, just about the art here is that if you've noticed on the side down in the bottom left there, we, we've been adding boats to our pier. And so each boat will sort of be in just another quick hint as to what the A, B, C, D, E are. So for A, we have that um, A-shaped, but also kind of um, carina-shaped anchor. For B, we have this sort of inflated boat for breathing, and you'll, you'll see more of those as we go. And while you're looking at the lungs, you want to uh, check for asymmetry, okay? Check for asymmetry for um, each lung and then you wanna check the lung markings, make sure they're there. Uh, check for calcifications, any nodules that you see. So, yeah. And those zones that Ben was explaining help you to go sort of in a horizontal path because we know the apex of the lung is gonna look very different than down near the diaphragm. But if you go kind of side by side from zone to zone, that's gonna help you make those comparisons for symmetry. So awesome on rounds. So after B comes C. So C is circulation and cardiac silhouette. So you can see here on our left, we have this rain spilling over the side. So this is our memorable sub symbol for circulation. So when I'm, when I'm talking about circulation, specifically, I'm talking about the great vessels. So the aorta, pulmonary trunk, pulmonary arteries, um, the SVC, and uh, cardiac silhouette is all of this stuff here in the middle. You see this heart labeled cargo, that's our cardiac silhouette. And so we wanna look at the borders, make sure they're uh, defined. We wanna see the size, uh, if it's too big. And we can actually uh, uh, gauge the size using something called the cardiothoracic ratio. And it's uh, very simple to calculate that actually. You just take the distance between the uh, cardio, cardiac silhouette and you divide that by the maximum horizontal distance of the thoracic cavity here. That number should be less than 0 0.5. Um, if it's greater than that, then you'll, you, you, it could mean that there's some cardiomegaly or pericardial effusion. And um, if we go to the next slide, we can see we can see these little yellow lines. So that's, uh, that'll help you remember that that space is our cardiac silhouette and that we can use the cardiothoracic ratio to um, gauge heart size. And along with those yellow lines that showed up, we also saw the bottom of the catamaran. So um, we're gonna be talking about D at this point. So we're gonna be talking about the diaphragm, which is represented by that the, the, the diaphragm of the, the catamaran. Um, and we're also gonna be talking about damage. And when we're looking at damage, we're gonna look at damage to bones. So our clavicle showed up here and our ribs showed up here. Um, and that'll help us to examine, uh, looking kind of side by side, looking for any breaks in the, in the bones, um, anything that might potentially cause a pneumothorax. And also the contusion, I'm sorry, the, the contour of the, the diaphragm 
Um, it's important to trace that out both sides, look out to the costophrenic angles, and also look beneath the diaphragm as well. And uh, last but not least, we've got E. Um, so E stands, depending who you ask, E might stand for a bunch of different things. Uh, it could stand for effusions, it could stand for equipment, uh, a nice maybe catch-all, though not perhaps as helpful, is just everything else. Um, so when we're talking about equipment, we're talking about uh, lines, central lines, stuff like that, wires, um, uh, ICD leads, any kind of chest tubes or things like that, surgical clips that might be there, even uh, like um, telemetry leads or stuff will show up on chest x-ray. So um, that's all stuff that, you know, some of it is very obviously uh, artificial and you can sort of ignore it or take it into consideration as you will. And sometimes some of those lines can add tricky little contours to stuff that you need to be really careful about. Uh, for effusions, we're talking about um, the way that pleural effusions tend to collect uh, in the costophrenic angle down there and sort of in the corners of the diaphragm uh, when patients are upright. So we've added those little rain buckets to catch the rain uh, down there at the bottom of the sails to represent that idea of effusions. Uh, and then, you know, we call it a chest x-ray, but you actually can see a little bit uh, uh, lower into the abdomen. Um, and in particular, you can see some air down there. So there's normal air, which is the gastric bubble. You usually have a little bit of air in your stomach, and that's totally okay. And then there's pneumoperitoneum, which is uh, not okay. And, and the difference between those can be a little subtle. Um, well, if, if the air is showing up on the right side of the patient, then it's probably not a gastric bubble. So that's you know an indication that maybe you need to worry. Um, but on the left side, uh, the gastric bubble tends to have a bit of a thicker rim around it but, uh, because the stomach wall is a little thicker than the diaphragm. Uh, if you see that thin crescent of air on the left side, uh, maybe start worrying or tap your attending on the shoulder. Um, so that's what I saw uh, when that medicine resident forwarded me the x-ray. I saw that little thin crescent of air under the diaphragm and my heart rate went up about 20 minutes per minute. And that's it. Um, we're going to leave our, our boy Gino just hanging there, unfortunately. Um, he's, <laughs> he's not having a great day, but uh, hopefully you enjoyed our little tour through the chest x-ray lesson. And we wanted to talk a little bit about how our students use Sketchy. Um, and we know that we have our video lessons, um, and that's where most of our students start off, you know, watching the video lessons and, you know, getting that memory and coding, and then allowing them allowing our students to run through our review cards allows for that memory consolidation piece and you can toggle on or off your symbols and really quiz yourself using the review card and then we also offer our quiz questions so that way you can self-assess and kind of review some of the content on your own and another question that we get asked pretty frequently is you know can i use sketchy with my other materials like how does it integrate and um, on the next slide, you can see that we've added our search bar function. So I know a lot of students will use Sketchy with some of their other materials, you know, some of the um, practice questions that you're taking or questions that your school's giving you. And if you notice that there's a concept that you need reinforcement or that, you know, just isn't sticking for you, great opportunity to use our search bar function and look for a lesson um, with some of that content in it. And sometimes that'll help to really drive home the concepts and make them sticky in your, your head as you're studying. Speaking of self-assessments and making things stick in your head. Yeah. So we've got two sample questions for you guys. Um, so I'll, I'll give you uh, about 30 seconds or so to uh, read it, and then we can uh, go over it. And maybe if you want to throw in the chat anything that seems a little red flaggy, anything that is concerning to you, we can make this sort of a group study process. Yeah, call out anything that seems particularly worrisome. Me being the urologist, all I'm worried about is the ED, but. <laughs> all right, so let's let's take a look here. So we have a 57 year old gentleman. He's got hypertension, type two diabetes, hyperlipidemia, chronic back pain, erectile dysfunction, comes to the emergency department. 
He's been having severe epigastric pain for the last three hours. Got some nausea, no vomiting. Uh, he's been having this upper abdominal pain for a while now. It looks like it's worse while sleeping and improves after eating and taking an antacid. So that's going to be uh, important clues uh, to tell us what he might be having. Uh, in terms of medications, he's taking candesartan, metformin, atorvastatin, ibuprofen, and talophil. Uh, as far as vitals are concerned, he's a febrile. Blood pressure looks normal, but he is, uh, he does have hypertension and he's on a medicine for that and he is overweight. So that's something just to keep in mind. He is tachycardic, pulse is regular though. Um, so he's in severe distress due to pain. Uh, minimally active, hypo, minimally hypoactive bowel sounds, diffuse abdominal tenderness with palpation, rigidity, guarding and rebound tenderness. So this should clue you in into what's happening. Uh, if we look at his labs here, he's anemic. Um, his potassium is low. Uh, next, slide, next slide, please. So is this guy sick or not sick? Are there red flags here? Yeah, absolutely. Definitely, Robert. There's big time red flags here. So what is the next best step in the management of this patient? So let's look at this chest x-ray. Um, you know, when you're looking at a chest x-ray, I want you guys to go over that same process we went over, A, B, C, D, E method. Um, airway breathing, circulation, here. cardiac silhouette, damage to bones, diaphragm, effusions, um, equipment and everything else. So it looks like we have uh, some free air underneath the right hemi diaphragm. Exactly, yeah. So what is the next best step? CT scan, the abdomen pelvis with oral contrast, emergent surgical intervention, upper GI endoscopy, ultrasound of the abdomen. Yes, so we wanna do emergent surgical intervention. We wanna get surgery involved because this patient has a perforated duodenal ulcer. So we don't wanna give oral contrast because that's gonna delay everything. Delaying surgery means uh, a higher mortality rate. So we wanna get the surgeons on board and get this patient to the OR ASAP. Um, Upper GI endoscopy, if somebody has a perforated viscous, like a hole in their intestine, you don't want to go in there, probe around. That'll make things worse. And then an ultrasound of the abdomen. Uh, since we're looking at free air, again, it's, this is not going to be important. And uh, in general, ultrasounds are not good at looking at air. Um, air is the enemy of ultrasound. One of my uh, uh, preceptors told me in, back in med school. So emergent surgical intervention. So that's what we wanted. And okay. before we click, does anyone remember the symbol for what was air under the diaphragm? What is, um, what are we seeing that with that pneumoperitoneum? Yeah, so do you guys remember we had that exploding gas can? Um, so air was pushing up on that catam catamaran netting and causing the diaphragm to be deviated upward. So that's our memorable symbol for free air under the diaphragm, pneumoperitoneum. Okay. So let's go to the next slide. Can we do another one? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Um, give you guys a chance to take a look at that. So, 72-year-old male uh, comes into the emergency department. He's been having increasing shortness of breath, productive fever, productive cough, fever, and chills. Taking antibiotics for a pneumonia diagnosed one week prior in the urgent care facility, but it hasn't really helped. And that's his chest x-ray. So what are we looking at? And Let's start. Let's, yeah, start at the beginning and go through your peer and then your A, B, C, D, E's. Exactly. So you want to go through your peer, your ABCDE, see if we've got a, a, an effusion, a huge pleural effusion on the left. Okay. If you look at the costophrenic angle uh, on the right, it's sharp, 
well defined on the left. There's some blunting. There's an opacity in the left uh, lower uh, zone. Uh, this is also called the meniscus sign because it sort of looks like a meniscus. Um, it's so, sort of up rather than down. Yeah, so we've got a pleural effusion. So let's go to the next slide. What is the ne next best step in the management of this patient? Echocardiogram, bronchoscopy, mediastinoscopy, or thoracentesis. So exactly, yep, that's right, thoracentesis. That's what we want to do. This patient has a pleural effusion, uh, a paranemonic uh, pleural effusion, uh, or sorry, a paranemonic effusion most likely uh, from the pneumonia, which hasn't really improved. But uh, we don't know that until we confirm it. So we have to sample the pleural fluid and um, get a culture, get a gram stain and confirm that. Uh, okay. Is there anything else that you guys wanna add to this? Oh, our symbol. Yeah, let's, let's uh, talk a little bit about our, our symbol for yeah. uh, pleural effusion. So we had uh, the water buckets. Gino hung some water buckets off the uh, wind sails. And so these water buckets are filled with water, which will help you remember that fluid likes to accumulate in this area in upright patients, the costophrenic angles. That's where pleural effusions uh, develop. So. Yeah, and there's a question about consolidation versus effusion. And, you know, it's tricky because they both kind of look white, but a lot of that gets back to the positioning. And that's why we start with the pier. So we know that our fluid's going to ac accumulate in the dependent areas due to gravity. So, um, you know, it's, it's optimal to get an upright film as opposed to a supine film. And also that meniscus sign that Asim was speaking to, you know, that it sort of curves versus, you know, being kind of blobby. Uh, so that's sort of another reason why we're leaning more towards this being an effusion rather than a consolidation. Nice. Strong work. Cool, cool. And we wanted to leave some time for Q&A and we are happy to answer Q&A about Sketchy, about any of our stuff, um, about medicine in general. Um, we are here. So um, if there are any questions about um, really anything that we can answer for you, we are happy to do so. Yep, fire away. Yeah, so there's a question about doing a BAL, um, bronchial alveolar lavage. So a fusion is kind of going to be on the outside. So it's not something you're going to be able to access from the inside. So um, you can't really collect that fluid, which is why we do the thoracentesis from the outside for a fusion. But you wouldn't want to do um, a BAL for that. So the meaning of the acronym PEER. Yeah, absolutely. So PEER basically stands for position, inspiration or inspiratory effort, exposure and rotation. So position is the position where the chest X-ray is taken. Um, so- That's like, is it like an AP? Is it lateral? Is it a PA? Is it supine? What position was the patient in? Exactly. In spiratory effort, we want to make sure the lungs are fully expanded because if they're not fully expanded, then we're not going to be able to see everything. Same thing with exposure. And then rotation can also alter uh, what we see. So. so if someone is supine in bed and they're taking really crappy inspiratory effort, um, the lungs can look really small and tiny, especially as the diaphragm pushes up. So that's why it's so important to consider all of these issues and, you know, really count down the ribs. And we go through that on our, our video um, in live time to show how we uh, count the ribs and make sure that we have an adequate inspiratory effort. 
Exactly. And then uh, one more thing. So if we're, if we're doing, looking at a supine AP versus a PA upright uh, view, the cardiac silhouette is going to look completely different. With the AP uh, supine, the cardiac silhouette is going to look much bigger. So it's going to look like cardiomegaly. So that's why we want to make sure we know what, how the image was taken. Yeah, the PA view is going to be sort of your gold standard best view. And PA is like posterior to anterior. So the first initial is what the beam is hitting first. So PA is from the back to the front. Yeah, I think one, one thing that can be a little tricky about these is that on the test, you often don't have time to do the whole analysis. And so it's really important. And I think kind of like we were doing here to let the question stem guide your viewing of the x-ray. But uh, when you're on rounds or you know when you're actually analyzing an x-ray, it's super important to do all these steps because the more you do them, the more it becomes second nature, the more you're able to just easily go through all these things. If you've, ever seen, if you've ever seen a radiologist look at an x-ray, it's, it's like the most impressive thing. It takes them 30 seconds and they're, they've seen every possible thing you can see. And that's just because they've looked at thousands and thousands of them. Um, so the more you're able to do all these steps every time, not on the test, the better off you're going to be when it's 3.30 in the morning intern here and somebody says, hey, can you look at this for me? And I, you know, my mind, it's almost kind of like driving. Like, you know, when you're first learning to drive, you know, you go through all the steps and you do the key and then you have to think about what gear you're going to switch into. But when you've been driving a while, you know, you end up at the store and you're like, you didn't even think about all the steps you, you took to get there. You know, it just, it, it just comes naturally. Um, but by learning a very systematic way of looking at a chest x-ray and doing it the same way every time, you kind of get that muscle memory and that, um, that, that automatic cognition um, that will really help you in those stressful situations for sure. So if you want to throw in the chat, any career interests, any budding surgeons, any IM folks, any thoughts right now? Hard to say. All right, I do see some questions coming in. Um, yeah, developing Anki cards. That, that's sort of a tricky one. Ben, do you want to take that? It, <laughs> that is a tricky one. The answer to your question, broadly speaking, Robert, is yes. Uh, <laughs> it's a slightly more complicated answer than that. Um, and I think what I would say is if you have more questions about that, uh, Brittany will toss a link to our Discord in uh, and we can chat more about it there. Uh, that's a great place in general to like test out new features that we're working on and uh, ask us other questions uh, when you, you know, when you're an hour out of this and you're like, oh, I wish I had asked that, uh, ask on Discord. Um, so Robert, come join our Discord and we can talk more about Anki there. Yeah. And, um... There's another question about, um, you know, the reason for the air under the diaphragm. And that's when it comes back to getting, you know, those really good histories. And, you know, the patient didn't have a history of trauma. So it's, you know, much lower down in our differential, although, you know, you always want to think of that in the back of your mind. Um, but he did kind of speak to those GERD symptoms. And um, it's probably more of, you know, more of a medical, um, surgical situation than a, a trauma situation. Yeah, but trauma can definitely also cause uh, air underneath the, free air underneath the diaphragm. So penetrating trauma, is, it should definitely be on the differential. Or even blood trauma with a, a ruptured viscous, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, how do we identify the location of the rupture? That's a great question. Yeah. So that's where the surgeons come in and they, they go in and then they literally look and see if they could find the location of the rupture. So. Run the yeah. bell. Yep. Yeah, I mean, the other thing though is it's, you're 
ideally trying not to just do that completely blind. And so, uh, you know, as Austin was kind of alluding to when he was reading the question stem for that question, hopefully there are clues in the patient's clinical history or their presentation or something that help you figure out what might be going on. So we heard about the symptoms of pain um, that resolve with an antacid that have been going on. We had some other clinical features that sort of made us more suspicious of an ulcer being the cause. And so that can then help you narrow down, you know, where you're looking for. Uh, exactly. And the fact that the patient had um, uh, rigidity, guarding, rebound tenderness, severe abdominal uh, tenderness, that also, uh, and the patient was unstable, uh, anemic, probably bleeding from the, from the ulcer, or definitely bleeding from the ulcer. So the, those clues will help you uh, narrowing uh, what's going on. And yeah, then, yeah, you know, epigastric pain uh, that moves to the lower right quadrant. Maybe you have an appy. Uh, if you have, you know, gallstones or right upper quadrant pain, maybe there's something going on there. So, you know, clinical history is super important here too. Absolutely. Yeah. And we also have some great content in some of our surgery um, course, um, looking at the different quadrants and where pain is located and where it's most likely to um, have pathology. Um, there's a question about is USG, is that ultrasound? I'm wondering, I, ultrasound would not really be helpful to pinpoint um, where it's coming from. And we didn't really get into fast exam here, but that, that would be another more of like a trauma kind of workup. Uh, we had a question about neuro. Coming this summer. I'm so excited about neuro. <laughs> I'm that do something unorthodox here. I'm just going to give you guys a little. So we say coming this summer, and we, I promise you, it's coming this summer. There's a little preview Ooh, of the piece. lessons yes. for, for neuro that's going to come out uh, in the next couple of months. Um, this is our vertebral pathology lesson as part of the trauma unit um the, within neuro within neuro so uh we're all we're all very very excited about this course highly anticipated so be on the lookout for that and you know a couple of things that we're doing a little bit unique this time around um you know you can see that the art is amazing and um we were able to uh obtain some artists um, who are really amazing at their job and um, they, they're creating really high quality stuff for us. And the other thing that we're integrating is a bit of a storyline and some characters that you're gonna see over and over within the content. So um, not only are we continuing with our sketchy memory, memory jogs and everything, but we're also um, kind of telling a story throughout to help really consolidate those concepts in the long-term memory. So um, yeah, there's some questions about kind of getting involved. Um, Discord is a great place to find us. I'm going to go back to our slideshow, but I got to stop first. <laughs> so I guess if there's no other immediate questions right now, um, we do have some final thoughts as well as our discount code that we want to share with you all. So we are gonna be sending out a survey. Um, we want to keep doing these webinars. We wanna make them useful and helpful to you all. So please let us know what we can do. Um, you know, we're, all, we're also always looking for feedback from our users. Um, that's the reason why we're doing the neuro course, um, we pulled our students and asked them what course should we do next. And uh, something 
like 78% of the students that we polled told us to do neuro, so we're doing it. Um, so we really do want the feedback. We do appreciate it and we do integrate it. We're here to serve y'all. And yeah. So we have opportunities to sign up for a free trial on our site. And um, we also have a 10% off discount code, summer 10.